If you would, grab your copy of God's Word back out and open it with me to Daniel. Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7. And you probably already noticed that there's this huge transition that's taking place in this book at this point especially. In fact, it's, it's gone from basic narrative about how Daniel and his buddies faithfully served and lived an undefiled life despite what their rulers did to them. And now it's going big picture. It's going into the future. But it uses this thing called apocalyptic language. The apocalypse. Figurative language. In fact, there are, there are people who have made their fortunes writing books on the subject, preaching many sermons on the subject. So when we roll into some apocalyptic text, I need you to understand some things, okay? Um, not everybody, all right, let me back up. Most of y'all got Netflix nowadays, got a DVR. You ever notice, or, VC, or, or VCR, boy, that's real old, isn't it? <laughs> I got any VCR still in here? Okay, oh my. You are old beyond your years, brother. That's your youth pastor. Hey, you can call it, you, you can say whatever you want, buddy. There's a reason they say you're older than Scott. I know that's an inside joke and I just ruined it for all of y'all. But listen, when you pull up your DVD player, your Netflix, and you're watching a movie, you can, you can stop for a second and you can take your cursor and you can run it along there. And it'll give you a highlight of what the next chapter's about. It'll tell you a little bit about this and a little bit about that. It'll just give you a glimpse. See, for me, it's usually, oh, this looks stupid and I want to make sure it's not going to end stupid. So I'll run down to the end. Okay, isn't that half the shows on Netflix, really? Come on. Or Hulu, or if you still have cable, rabbit ears. And I'll get to you sometime. But, but seriously, there, you, you wanna, it, it's a glimpse. It's kind of like when, when I was in college and, and, and I had to write a paper and take a test on the death of a salesman. Y'all read the book, right? I didn't, and I failed the test because I use the cliff notes. Now cliff notes is one of those little things supposed to give you a nice summary. Yeah, the teacher saw that too and didn't ask any questions from the cliff notes. I watched the movie too, didn't help. When we start looking at visions of the future and it's written in figurative language, you need to understand that you're just seeing snapshots of the future. You're seeing the high mountaintops of the future. You're not necessarily seeing every detailed scene that will take place coming in the future. So when we pick up on this, understand that there's a lot of guys out there and some of you probably have the books on your shelves or you own the movie or whatever that think they know everything that happens in between. Folks, can I tell you something? They don't have a clue. They're guessing. They take a little touch of Revelation and they sprinkle in a little Daniel and they take a little Ezekiel just to make it all sound good. But at the end of the day, the whole purpose in apocalyptic language is to bring us hope for the future in the current turmoil of the world we live in. And some of you might say, well, yeah, our world's not in that much turmoil. In the United States, it's actually very stable, right? Everybody, there's pretty much from day to day, a dollar's still a dollar, right? You know, it, it's changing. I don't know what inflation is, but it's like 3%, whatever. You know, and your dollar always pays le buys less each year. But nonetheless, we're in a stable environment. None of us were worried about getting robbed on the way to church this morning, were you? Did anybody think about it? No, because this is Maybank. We're blessed. Now, if you go to... Uh, Gun Bear Walmart, that's different. But 
but, but, but seriously, we live in a very stable world. Now, there are Christians in other parts of the world, and, and these believers who were in Babylon and, 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 and the ancient Near East, they had it a lot tougher than us. There are, people, there are Christians in, in Africa and, and in the Middle East and, and, and China and around the world that are suffering persecution. We remember when ISIS was all that in a bag of chips that they were beheading Christians all the time and putting it on YouTube, right? We're not quite in that kind of chaos that's because the kind of attack that we're under, the kind of warfare that we're struggling with is more subtle. It's more under the radar. They call a place Planned Parenthood and they say, oh, this is to take care of women and their needs. But what it is, is a place to murder babies. I'm just not gonna pull any punches and I've hurt any feelings, I'm sorry. And we should work to have alternatives for those ladies that need proper medical attention. We call things one thing when it's another. Over and over again, we see the anti-hero, which would be the bad guy who turns out to be the good guy in the end. But folks, I want you to understand, this passage is gonna show us that evil is evil, it's ugly. And that God is good and beautiful. So let's pick up, let's catch up. Got a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff to talk about, a lot of symbols uh, to run through. So anyway, so he's having a, it, it's way back when Bathshabar is the king and uh, he's having a dream. We're going to pick up in verse two. It says, Daniel said, I was looking into a vision by night and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. The four great beasts and four great beasts were coming up from the sea different from one another. So the first thing we see is that, that out of the sea comes these great beasts. Now, you need to understand that to the Hebrew, the Mediterranean Sea, that was the great sea to them, what, man, they were not a seafaring people, okay? They did not like the water, they didn't care for it. So to start a vision, God's gonna give them a vision and say evil comes from where you think evil comes from. They weren't painting a picture other than that. So there's the chaos and the turmoil, and you got the four winds going all over the place. And there are these four beasts that come up out of the water. Four beasts that move forward. And they come from a source that would be considered evil. The first was like a lion and the wings of an eagle. I kept looking until the wings were plucked and it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man. A human mind also was given to it. Now many believe this is Babylon because Babylon at this point was on her last legs fixing to be conquered by the Medians, Midians, I always say it wrong, about to get conquered. And then Cyrus, the medial Persian Empire come through about to take place. So they're on their last legs, they're at the end. Many believe the Medo-Persians were this next beast. Listen to the next beast. It says, and another beast, a second one resembling a bear, and it was raised up on, on one side, and three ribs were in its mouth between its teeth. And they said, arise and devour the meat. Now. Many think, like I said, this was Medo-Persia. There are some people that argue that this is Russia because they're the bear. But by and large, most people think it was Babylon, Medo-Persia. Some people think it was just Medo. And then the next one could be Persia or Greece. Listen, and then there's a third one. Now, they were very fire, very quick, ready to pounce. I gotta find my spot. Boy, little writing is tough, man. I'm getting old. Short arm disease is eating me up. Good grief, man. What happened? All right, number six, verse six. After this, I kept looking, and behold, one another, like a leopard, which, which had on its back four wings of a bird. And the beast also had four heads, and dominion was given over to it. Like I said, this one's sometimes considered the Greeks. It's sometimes considered Persia. It's just cording on the arguments of what's going on because they were fast attacking, able to accomplish things. Many people want to argue about who the four heads were. They can identify different successions of kings to say these are the four kings that were part of either Greeks or part of the, the Persians. But 
none of them are convincing. They're struggling. They're, 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 they're grasping at straws to a point. And then again, he says a fourth one, verse seven, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrifying and extremely strong. It had large teeth. It devoured and crushed and trampled down the remainder with its feet. It was different from all the other beasts. Now stop right there for a second. Do you notice he doesn't put an animal on it? He doesn't describe directly an animal. You gotta know this thing was just grotesque, like you wouldn't believe. You see, the others were some version of an animal. The characteristics here are so horrendous that he's not even offering us an animal to think about. Now he goes forward, now this one, it had, and on, on this piece, it was different than the others, and it had 10 horns. While I was contending, contemplating the horns, behold, another horn, a little horn came up among them, and three of the first horns were pulled out of the roots before it. Behold, the horn, the horn possessed eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth utter, uttering great boast. So this, was, this is a horrendous picture of evil. To the outward thing, to the outward appearance, evil looks good. Many times we'll just stare at it and go, man, that looks great. Hey, let's face it, the best commercials on TV are by some kind of vice, right? I mean, I could probably start quoting beer ad jingles and you could tell me the brand. Oh, not me, I'm a good Baptist. Come on. Let's just be real and just be honest. You know, if I go dilly dilly, oh, you know, don't you? Tastes great? Mm-hmm, I'm messing with all you. You see, the thing is, evil, we forget to paint evil as it truly is, and that is evil. Call it what it is. Because now he's about to describe God. He's about to describe God. And I want you to understand that these, though you'll notice that in my Bible, and it should be in your Bible as well, it turns into a poem structure because it's beautiful. You know, when I was a little boy, my grandmother would look at me and say, why are you being so ugly? Because beautiful children don't act like that. There is a beauty to God. Listen, he says, I kept looking until the, thorns were, until the thrones were set up and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His vestiture was like, was like white snow and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was ablaze with flames. Its wheels were a burning fire. A river of fire was flowing and coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands were attending him and myriads upon myriads were standing before him. The court sat, the books were opened. Notice the beauty of the presence of God. The glorious nature of being in his throne room. White symbolizing his Purity, no failure, no sin, no evil. There is no darkness in God. We go back to the evil representatives. It was all ugly. It was all dark. It was all scary. But the ancient of days, we see his glory. We see his position until he thrones were set up. This, and he took his seat, meaning everything he needed to do has been accomplished. He is able to do. It is complete. His plans are perfect. Notice that this is obviously a judgment seat, a judgment situation, because we see that fire flows from it, that, that from the wheels there's also fire. And these wheels are a picture of his throne also somehow being kind of like a chariot. I just can't imagine. Kind of crazy to look at. What was the words I used? Apocalyptic language. Figurative. It's hard. It's not easy. But we see the contrast between good and evil. 
that the ancient of days was there able and ready to judge. The books were opened. He had all the evidence he'll ever need. Do you realize there's not a thought that we've ever had that God doesn't know about? There's not an action that we've ever taken that God is not aware of. All the evidence is there. Of course, we know that there is one hope of making sure that that debt does not come upon us. But we'll get to that in a minute. Then it talks about a judgment. It says, then, verse 11, it says, then I kept looking because of the sound of the boastful words which the horn was speaking. I kept looking until the beast was slain and its body was destroyed and given to the burning fire. We see that one day this one will be judged. This one, and many believe that this one to be judged is the Antichrist himself. If we jump over just a little bit toward into the interpretation, and, and I know somebody's going to fuss and say, well, you skip some stuff. I'll get back to some of it, okay? Skip down to verse, oh, man, those letters are small. Verse 25, and it says, and he will speak out against the Most High and wear down the saints of the highest one. He will intend to make alterations in times and in law. And they will be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. You start thinking about the world we live in. What are they doing? They're trying to bring around people and ministers and get people with doctors who will give them a theology that they, or an interpretation that they can agree with. Meaning, Meaning you see these people, they come out of universities that were once created to produce pastors, Bible-believing pastors. That would be Harvard. That would be Princeton. That would be Wake Forest. And that would even be Duke University. And now their schools of theology are nothing more than shams Factories that seek to manipulate God's word in a way that it should not. It's terrible. But it's the world we're in. That is what is coming. So when we look at this, we see that, that God has a plan. That we see even that God raised up these, these beasts out of the sea. And that we also that know that God is in total control, verses 9 and 10. We see his total control, 9, 10, and 11. We see this. We see that he's in control despite the way the world looks, sometimes feels, because a lot of times things are unfair. But he will judge because he ultimately wins. Verse 13, it says, And I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like the Son of Man was coming, and he came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. Folks, I want you to know that's talking about Jesus. Jesus himself and in the New Testament it says over and over that he is the son of man. He is the one who will come on the clouds. He will come one day and judge now notice here also, it is equating the Son of Man, the one coming on the clouds, also with the Ancient of Days. And you say, how do you see that? As is presented before him, verse 14, and it says, and to him is given dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. Now some of you are going, oh, serve him, no big deal. No, <laughs> no, Worship him. You do realize that, that worship and serve are basically the same words. 
To kneel down is also another word for worship. Now, I don't know if all of you have been here every week, but we've studied Daniel. Uh, wow, we've been in this book seven weeks now, haven't we? And week after week, when a king says, worship me or worship my idol instead of your God, what does Yahweh do on Daniel or his friend's behalf? He intervenes. Because there will be no other gods before him. For our God is a jealous God. He is a loving God. And he is determined to ensure that he is the only one who is worshipped. And yet here, he says, he will be worshipped. He will be served. You know, something just quick. This is for free. You see, service, too many times we think worship is only when we sing on Sunday morning. We think worship is only when we sing on Sunday morning. And somebody will say, hey, pastor, you know, but you just said our purpose is to connect people to Christ through worship, service, and discipleship making. Well, didn't that kind of run together? Well, what I mean by worship in that first part is collective worship of community, congregational worship. But service in every way is worship to God. That's, that's why when Paul says, whatever you do in deed or song or this, you do it under the glory of God, under the glory of the Lord. So that's important to understand that that very simple thing. You know, a lot of times when we see ap uh, apocalyptic language and, and, and we want to see the end of the book and we want to know what the last chapter looks like and, and Daniel here is no different and he even goes to someone in the, in the vision and, in, and right there in verse 16 and he says, and standing by began asking him exact meaning of all this. And he told me, and made known to me that interpretations of these things, these great beasts, which are four in number, are four kings who will rise from the earth. But the saints of the highest one will receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, for all ages. Did you notice he didn't name names on which nations were which? I have heard some say that those nations could easily be Nazi Germany, Stalin's Russia, Mao's China, and I, and I forget the, the is, it, is it Burma, where all of the people were massacred over and over and over again? They tried to cut everybody out, not to mention African nations. We know that there are 10 horns on the back with one big one coming. 10 is generally a, an image of completeness. It could be a symbolic number. It doesn't have to be 10 specific kingdom. It could be many evil kingdoms that come. That's not what's important. What's important is, is all the, e what, all the evil will be vanquished by the ancient of days, by the one who is like the son of man. It will all be vanquished by him. Now we can, I can just give you some summary of, of the, some of the what's going on. He begins to talk about what the third, the, the, the little horn is going to be as it grow and, and how evil it was gonna be. And we already touched base a little bit on how it would alter alter the law and alter the times and, and, and try to confuse the people. Many believe that's the Antichrist, but we know that there are many of Antichrist as well. But there's good shot. Some of us are sitting here today, okay, preacher, I don't live in a country where I can't freely worship Jesus. I want you to know that there's spiritual warfare going all, all around you. 
There is evil all around you. You know, everyone who is not in Christ is nothing more than the walking dead. Do me a favor, flip over to Colossians 2. Colossians 2. Trust me, it's worth your time. You need to understand that there is an already but not yet nature to this kingdom. And I'm just going to read part of the Daniel passage for you. You might have noticed that in verse 12 of Daniel that I did not read all of it. I said, as for the rest of the beast, their dominion will, was taken away, but an extension of life was granted to them for the appointed period of time. Victory was a hand. Victory was accomplished. But there's some time in between here and there. Well, listen to verse 13 of Colossians. Verse 13. It says, when you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, when we were dead, we were walking dead without Christ, we're walking dead. He made you alive together with him, having forgiven all our transgressions. You know, all that stuff that's written in that book that he pulled out with all the evidence against us. Yeah. It's better than white out, folks. It's called delete. It's gone. When Christ paid the price and we received his forgiveness, verse 14, having canceled out our certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us. And he has taken, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. All of our sins and transgressions for all those who would believe so that we could have a relationship with God, so we could be a part of the kingdom of God. But catch this, verse 15, it says, when he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. You see the picture that's painted? The picture that's painted is victory. The picture that is painted is victory. But an extension of time was granted to them for an appointed period of time. You see, Christ already won. Victory is assured on the cross. But evil still roams. Evil still wages against us. Folks, I want you to know that it was a blowout victory. Absolute and complete. I'm just making sure you're awake by getting louder. But you got to play on through the third and fourth quarters. You got to play on until the end. And if you don't try, you don't work hard, you dishonor your team. You dishonor your coach. Let me say it this way. You dishonor your Lord. I've never understood people who quit during sporting events. No matter how bad you're getting beat, it doesn't matter. You have your own honor to worry about. In our case, we are Christians and we have the honor of our Lord that we're fighting for until the day he returns. You see, way too many people, they get lost in Daniel, they get lost in Revelation, and they spend all this time drawing up graphs and charts and, and, and pulling out their newspaper and saying, this right here is this. And then six years later, they say the same thing with the same passage. This right here is this. And nobody ever calls them out and says, false prophet. Be careful. Be careful on that stuff. 
They spend so much time, they forget about the most important job, and that is serving the Lord Jesus Christ and extending his kingdom until he comes home. Telling everyone about the forgiveness of sins that is offered in him. Offering everyone an opportunity to be made beautiful. You see, the blood of Christ washes us white as snow. When we are dead in our trespasses, we are dirty and filthy. But when we're covered in the blood of Jesus, we are made clean. We are made beautiful because of his righteousness, because of his wonder. But we've got to fight until then. We've got to fight on until then. Some people don't realize and don't understand that when Jesus was talking, and I'm just giving you so you can jot it down, in Luke, 16, in Luke 17, verse, verse 20, it says, Now having been questioned by the Pharisees as to what the kingdom of God... Uh, to when the kingdom of God was coming, he answered them and said, the kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed, nor will they say, look, here it is, or there it is. What's he saying? He's saying, you know, go pick up your books. They're not gonna find it like that. Folks, and when Jesus comes back, you're not gonna know because the Bible says what? He's gonna come like a thief in the night. We need to be found serving him. But listen, he goes further and he says, for behold, this is Jesus speaking, the kingdom of God is in your midst. You see, Jesus is the kingdom of God. And wherever he goes, so goes the kingdom. The kingdom is established. You know, isn't it interesting if you just go a few pages to Luke, Luke 10, when Jesus sent out the 70, and don't worry, I'm not gonna read all of it, but I'm gonna give you just a little bit of it because and we have a responsibility. We live in a world that's chaos. We may not be in physical danger, but we're in spiritual danger, folks. Our communities are in spiritual danger and we're constantly under attack. It says in chapter 10, verse, verse eight, it says, whatever city you enter and they receive you, eat what is set before you and heal those in it who are sick and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near you. But whenever a city, but whatever city you enter and they do not receive you, go out into the streets and say, even the dust of your city, which clings to our feet, we wipe off and protest against you. Yet be sure of this, that the kingdom of God has come near. We talk a lot in here about the very fact that the church is not these four walls, don't we? The church is you, the people. It is the Holy Spirit that resides within us that allows us to be the church. That is the kingdom. That is the kingdom of God. And it is our job to take the kingdom of God everywhere we go. That when, when Jesus parts that eastern sky, we will not be found like the disciples who were just sitting there. Remember, remember what the disciples did as Jesus ascended? They just sit there and stared. Uh, I think they were mouth breathing. You, you know what I'm trying to say? That's why Jesus had to send an angel. He said, what are y'all doing? You've been given a mission and a purpose. Now go fulfill that mission and purpose. Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. The kingdom of God is in our midst because Jesus is in our hearts. And we should be found faithfully serving. Is the battle going to be tough? Is it going to be ugly? Will it get as bad as it is in Syria where people are being murdered for their faith? I don't know if it's going to get that bad here. It could. Are you ready to stand by God's plan and trust him? Because in the end, he wins. God wins. So he's shown us a picture of the last chapter of his plan. We should have confidence in knowing that when we go forth in his name, that we don't have to fear men who could hurt the body. We honor the God who has power over the soul. So until Jesus returns, don't kill yourself trying to figure out what you don't know. I spent a week and I still don't know who all those kingdoms are supposed to be. 
And this isn't the first time I've preached this passage, so I can tell you I've spent a lot of time on this thing. Got a lot of notes. The most effective use of our time is serving the living God and furthering his kingdom. So if you're here this morning and you don't know Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want you to know that you can be made beautiful this day. You can be washed clean in the blood of Christ. If you're here this morning and, and you're a Christian, but you just, you don't know, you've been backslidden for a long time, doing your own thing. Business is more important. Sports are more important. Everything else is more important than the worship of Jesus, than the getting up and studying God's word daily and the praying to Jesus. I want you to know today is a good day to repent and come back into the fold. Let us pray.